In this episode of our special show, The Journey, our guest is a gentleman who wears many hats. A noted researcher, a trainer, a social worker, an author, and of course, a parliamentarian. Also, the head of India's premier cultural body, the Indian Council for Cultural Relations. A nationalist to the core, who has managed the smooth transition from training and analysis into active politics without a hitch. Welcome, Vinay Shastrabuddeji. Namaskar. Namaskar. Member of Rajya Sabha and President of ICCR. Vineji, yours indeed is a very interesting, multifaceted journey, if I may say so. Uh, between being a parliamentarian, a researcher, an author, a chief of a cultural body, and of course the uniqueness of political training of an institute, uh, which role do you really think is closest to your heart? Well, to be very honest, uh, I mean, it may sound uh, a little unacceptable to many because uh, there are routine answers to these kinds of questions and I take it very seriously. But when I look back, I really feel that perhaps uh, every other role came to me as a part of uh, my, in a way, destiny, but at the same time, based on my likings, my inclinations and whatever the abilities I have. And therefore, uh, like they say that uh, which, whichever God you worship, after all, the worship reaches to the Almighty yeah, uh, and that is the only single one. True. So, I am basically a karyakarta and therefore, whatever the role, the decision makers, whether the party leaders or the government leaders want me to play, I have been playing it dutifully and trying to contribute uh, uh, as per my abilities and capacity. But Vineji, it's very rare to have somebody uh, who has come from the background of Rambhav Malgi Prabodhini and I know from my personal experience, the kind of training you give to people who want to be in public life, it's probably the first of its kind and probably not even emulated by other political parties. World over, this kind of a process of training is highly appreciated. Yeah, it is because basically, you know, I mean, uh, post uh, Second World War, uh, there was kind of end of colonial rule in several countries and it saw what they call as the third wave of democracy. Hmm. And many countries started uh, adopting the democratic governance system. But then democracy is not just about elections. Hmm. Democracy is not just about uh, political parties. Democracy is all about, is also about governance. And when it comes to governance, certainly some kind of capacity building is required. See, you are popular is one thing, which is why you get elected. Absolutely. But popularity is not parallel to your ability. And therefore, those who get elected, we also want to convert them into people with the ability and skill and understanding of the process, process of governance, which is so very intricate, complicated. It's mm. not easy. Yeah. And therefore, that understanding required. Therefore, the training as what we offer in the uh, Mahalgi Prabodhini Mahal Institute hmm. is basically on three lines. One is motivational training because you lose a sense of purpose the moment right. you get elected. All the things are right. so very attractive and you get uh, and so immersed changes, into that. it changes your basic yeah. instinct. So, the motivational training is required which tells you about your ideology, your policies and hmm. so on and so forth. Second is the functional training about the laws, about your responsibilities, about your duties and the third is skill training. Because a politician and that to an elected representative has to be a good public speaker. Absolutely. Has to be a good writer. Yeah. Has to be a And has to be a good analyst. communicator like yeah, the Prime course, Minister. True, true. Probably never before have we Precisely. had a Prime Minister who communicates on a daily basis with every segment and section of society. But I want to ask you, Vineji, uh, there's one thing which is research and there's one thing which is policy, uh, kind of making policies for future generations, for the country at large, which sometimes the electorate does not even understand. How important is policy when it comes to research? See, basically, uh, the very idea of uh, political party competition in a democracy hinges upon the policy views that a political party adopts to. 
Do all political parties have that? Unfortunately, na not. I mean, it's very sad. Uh, so, so would say. you say the Bharatiya Janata Party is the only party that has concentrated on policy I, research? I, I distinctly remember that few years back, the Communist Party uh, of India, Marxists, they had mm. attempted uh, and set up a policy research institute of mm. their own. But unfortunately, the person who was in charge later on left the party. So I don't know uh, what exactly is the situation over there. But Shainaji, I must tell you, and I take pride in this, although this is not a partisan uh, forum as such. Yeah. But I am really happy to say here that BJP is the only party mm -hmm. which has a very structured policy research department. And not only in the party, but in the organization also. There are various morchas. Every morcha is now equipped with a policy research cell. And there are people who are uh, kind of allotted, I mean, dedicatedly taking care of the policy research uh, things in their uh, particular morcha. So, we attach adequate importance to policy research in the party because we believe that every political party has to be ideology based. And the ideology has to reflect through the policies. Later on, the policies are required to be taken to the implementation level when you come uh, and acquire power. So, that, there is a definite linkage between the two. Otherwise, and that very, in itself is a journey. Of course, otherwise the very rationale behind setting up a political party, it becomes questionable. Vinayji, it's common perception that, you know, when you're studious in nature, when you come from a background of research, analysis, policy, I mean, the rumble tumble of politics is not everyone's cup of tea, but you chose to have this transition. Tell us about this journey and why you chose to enter active public life. Well, uh, I mean, there is some kind of a spirit of uh, activism. Uh, activist uh, has several other connotations. Yeah, yeah. Activism, so activism. Yeah. There's a difference between activism yeah. and activism. <laughs> I, I believe so. So that was there perhaps yeah. uh, in it kind of. Uh, and uh, I did my PhD on a subject which is about political parties as victims of populism and yeah. electoral compulsions. Very and interesting. And a quest for systemic solutions. Very, because very we have interesting. To take political parties what out. What was your takeaway from yeah. that? No, basically we require a huge amount of reforms. Electoral reforms we require, we require systemic reforms. Even the way our parliament functions, and I'm I'm a very junior member of the parliament for just about five years, but I believe there are uh, huge things which we require to change. I mean, today technology is so advanced. If a member of parliament wants to ask a question, uh, presenting a video, for example, or a real time evidence of some construction work going on, or if the minister wants to explain why should he not be allowed to make a PPT in the Lok Sabha or Rajya Sabha, I mean. We, so, we have to advance, we have to re, uh, now take it to a different level. You represent my home state, Maharashtra, but you've also had a huge connect with Madhya Pradesh. I want to ask you that what is the implementation of the policies or the yojana, current government that have percolated down to the poorest of poor in both states and for that matter the whole country? See, one distinctive feature of uh, the governance philosophy of this government is its emphasis on implementation. And Prime Minister Narendra Modi, if I may put it very humbly, is the master of the art of implementation. I think there will be a case study in international there universities are, There already too. have been. I mean, yes. the way he follows up the things, the way he makes people answerable, the way he himself is answerable. I mean, Accountability. You know, today, for example, they have that Pragati kind of program. Every Gee. last Wednesday, Prime Minister questions hmm. all the uh, significant uh, departments and even the state chief secretaries and reviews the progress. And here is a Prime Minister who is able to ask a question to a Prime Min to a chief secretary or for that matter, even a chief minister that you had promised that you will give the clearance obtained by your own uh, environment department to a railway project within two months. Now it is almost three months. Why have you not been uh, able to do that? He can ask the question because he, he can answer the questions. Central government schemes are being implemented flawlessly. The last mile uh, outreach is uh, a significant part of the... Irrespective of dispensations? Well, uh, I cannot uh, I mean, see it because there are cases of... Uh, different uh, governments uh, not taking the central government schemes uh, with due seriousness. 
and they are putting some obstacles or they are kind of hijacking it. For example, there is a scheme of the government which provides some couple of crore rupees to polytechnics and I ITIs for mm. uh, change in the syllabus to make it tuned to the uh, changing technologies. Now there are instances, I won't be naming the state, it will become too partisan, sure. where they have kept the couple of crore rupees in a bank account and they are earning a huge amount of interest on it and the syllabus remains the old archaic and obsolete now. So what can a central government do in this case? So, so federalism is not just uh, limited to yeah, limited to center taking a particular position. It has to the be the coordination between perfect, the states perfect. and the center because otherwise there is no federalism. Yeah. Uh, Vinayji, you had the most premier cultural institute ICCR and if I may say so you have taken quite a few radical moves or steps, uh, one being uh, your Ramayan festival where you invite international countries, even countries such as Brunei, which really do not have much to do with the Ramayana. What was the thought behind this and do you think this is just a right wing policy thought process or it is part of culture? <laughs> well, I really laugh at those uh, who try to describe it as this wing, that wing. I mean, the Ramayana is the wing of all of us. I mean, how can we imagine the idea of India without Ramayana? or Mahabharat for that matter or Bhagavad Gita for that matter. So they are a part of India. True. They, you cannot imagine India without uh, these kinds of things. N having said that, Ramayana festival is something which the ICC has started in 2015 and uh, every year we have been conducting it. Last year we could not due to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But every time we invite countries and several countries send their troops and they are very happy to participate. Not only neighboring countries but Southeast Asia and some um, countries like Fiji also. Uh, but the shocking one is Brunei. Yeah, because our officials were a little hesitant whether we should send and invite because Brunei is a 100% Islamic country. Absolutely. And a, a declared Islamic country. But much to our surprise and a sweet surprise, the Brunei troop came, they presented a beautiful Ramayana and when one of our officials asked them that we were a little doubtful whether you will come, they said, boss, you are making a mistake. We have changed our religion, not our culture. So I was trying to tell you that uh, the Brunei troop, not only did uh, the troop came over here and come over here and then they made a beautiful presentation of Ramayana. But when one of our officials asked, they said, uh, you do not make a mistake, we have changed our religion, not our culture. And this is very important. In fact, I must tell I you… I think that is a big learning for all of yeah, India. Of course, of course, another big learning, a similar story and how uh, kind of convoluted and perverse kind of thinking mm. is there in, in our country at, in some quarters significantly. Uh, when the Iranian president came to India in, nine, in 2017, I believe, he had a long discussion with the Honorable Prime Minister and there he mentioned that perhaps in your country uh, there must be some awareness about the fact that we speak Persian and Sanskrit is the home of, uh, I mean India is the home of Sanskrit but the grammarian who gave the structure of both Persian and Sanskrit is the same and he is known as Maharshi Panini. So we should be doing something about Maharshi Panini. So, under the instructions, Prime Minister also talked to ICCR people and we organized a two-day seminar on Maharshi Panini's contribution as a grammarian in Tehran. University of Tehran was our partner. They were the co-hosts mm -hmm. and it went on really very well. I was happy to be there for the inaugural session. And when the Vice Chancellor of the University of Tehran was taking me around, he just cursorily mentioned and asked me that uh, in our country, in our university, we teach Upanishad. Tell me in which university in India Upanishad is being taught. Upanishads, yeah. yes. But do you think the younger generation is even interested in the Upanishads? Yes. Uh, do you think the younger generation is interested in cultural activities that ICCR offers? And if so, what are they? And what should we be doing to motivate them without sermonizing in that direction? No, no, no question of sermonizing. See, after all, culture is a part of your identity. Hmm. I mean, and identity is something you cannot wish away. And not only you have to live with, but you have to have a legitimate sense of pride in it as well. 
True. Which is why these days uh, the melting pot yeah. is no more acceptable. People mm. say it is salad bowl, where you maintain your identity mm. and be a part of the whole. Like a uh, thing so you in have a to assimilate yeah. as well, but you yeah. have to keep your own identity. Correct, and that identity is very very critical. Uh, Shakespeare said, "What is in name?" But everything is in name. In fact, I said uh, <laughs> in lighter wind uh, to one of our cabinet uh, to a member of parliament that your name is Jai Ram. If somebody says Jai Shri Ram, you would object, object <laughs> to that. So there is something so there in is name. Something in a name. So the point I am trying to make is that the younger generation is also conscious of it. And therefore, we need to be talking to them, have a conversation with them. And I must tell you that younger generation, younger talents and the way they are manifesting Indian culture, I think is really very brilliant. These days, we are uh, conducting a program which is Gen X Democracy. Achha. Because democracy is a part of our culture. See, one of the most... And it's uh, very apt at 75 years on with Mahatsav to do a I program mean, such as this. Let us not uh, misperceive that culture is only about song and music and dance and things like that. Culture is also about a vibrant democracy. Of course, uh, culinary and cuisines, our democracy, our philosophy, our hmm. language, Sanskrit, Ayurveda, everything is a part of our culture. And ICCR is working on all these fronts. Therefore, we have invited uh, through a series which is called as Gen X Democracy Network, below 35 years of age, mm -hmm. young politicians from over 75 democracies. Across the, the yeah, globe? Yeah, across the globe. First batch came here in the month of December. Later on, this Omicron and all these things started. So we have put a full stop right now, not a full stop, mm -hmm. a comma rather, and we will be starting again. And when these people came, there were two Jamaican members of parliament, very young ladies, in hardly in their 30s, mm. they said visiting India is a great learning because the kind of misperception was there and of was, India being yeah, the land of snake charmers correct, has correct, totally correct. changed. So uh, it's it's a great learning, and uh, there was another message coming from a Polish uh, member of parliament, again a lady, young lady. She said, "Let me tell you, India will have to blow its own trumpet. Global community will not do anything." No. You have to do that. Mm. And there comes the significance of soft power. See, soft power is not only about goodwill. India has abundant goodwill about it everywhere. Go to any nook and corner and, and Indians will be it. welcome. Yeah. But goodwill is not enough. We have to convert, we have to translate this goodwill into a proper understanding about the idea of India. And there lies the challenge. And there comes the importance of soft power. And therefore, I believe uh, the ICCR is uh, very in that resolutely direction. trying to have the younger generation as well uh, a part of this journey. Your widely read book, Beyond a Billion Ballots, uh, has been highly acclaimed and it talks about electoral reforms. Nine years down, where do you think we stand when it comes to electoral reforms? And what was the motive behind writing a book on Indian uh, balloting system? I'll take the second part of the question yeah. first because the motivation was basically when I saw and studied several political parties and I have friends like many of us have in many political parties and the way they are being run, I believe that somewhere down the line they have lost the very sense of purpose behind being in politics as a party, as an organization. Yeah. And many political parties have become kind of dynasty driven parties, you know that, true, is, true. that is a very sorry state of affairs. So, where is the rationale behind uh, the existence of the party? Do you have any different doctrine, hmm. any different policy view, any hmm. different way of conducting your organization? Hmm. Nothing. So, you have become kind of a very typical political party and hmm. a particular mold with which you come out and therefore you talk uh, alike, you speak alike, you behave alike, you work alike, you govern alike. So, when everything is the same, Similar. the yeah. element of choice evaporates hmm. gradually. Hmm. And democracy is all about the element of choice. If there is no choice, democracy is zero. But sadly, there is very limited choice. I agree, which is why the importance of uh, ideology driven parties like BJP. And the emphasis on ideology gets lost when there are too many elections. Because so, you believe in one, one nation, nation, one, one election. election. Yeah, that is one of the significant reforms. But do you think that's a reality that can happen? 
well, one can only work together. If it is to happen, only this Prime Minister yeah, can do Yeah, of course, it. of course, beyond because doubt. Because he has done doubt. so many of the so impossible. So, I only hope that wiser councils will prevail mm -hmm. and eventually they would see. And, in fact, uh, very sorry to say so, I am not uh, commenting like a party person, but it's a fact that those parties who had agreed to the uh, Parliamentary Standing Committee report uh, headed by a Congress person mm. on the need for one nation, one election or simultaneous elections, whatever may, you may call it, unfortunately have backtracked. A lot of people have talked about India being a soft power. Do you think the ICCR has any role to play to make India a global player or do you think all of that is completely independent of the cultural No, side? no, no, it is because as you might have realized that in China for, for that matter hmm. or there are many other countries, they have their Confucius institution, there is British Council, there is American Centre. ICCR should be seen in the context of these organizations. Because the very mission of ICCR is to make the global community understand what India is all about. And I believe there is a huge backlog on that. True. As I hmm. just mentioned that there is a huge amount of goodwill, but little understanding about what India is. And to create that understanding, we have to work over time. And that is what we are trying to do. Vineji, you are the chairman of the Standing Committee for Education. And one of the huge controversies is where you say that the 1921 Malabar incident should be part of the curriculum. Is there need to include it? See, you cannot push certain things under the carpet. For example, let's take the other example. In Hindu uh, belief system, in certain parts, in certain communities, but there used to be the practice of untouchability. Yes. Even now, there are scars of that uh, very wrong kind of uh, way of looking at it uh, or the wrong practice if I may say. But then can we just forget and we say no, 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 it was not there. We cannot. It's a fact of life. There were these systems and people have braved uh, all these atrocities uh, and even today we are not completely out of that. So now the... we have to accept that. Likewise, whether it is Malabar or uh, Vijayanagar or whatever it is, I mean, good uh, part of history and the bad part of history. So, you feel there should be a learning from history? Of course. Of and course. And that learning is selective to what the Standing Committee Education Chairman decides? No, not or at all. Or should it be a democratic process? Chan standing Committee is not just one person. It's multiple. I mean, there are political yes. parties and yes, their there representatives are representatives uh, from all parties. as members yeah. of parliament. And therefore, whatever we have said is recommendatory. And the relevant bodies, uh, either they go by our recommendation or they have their own uh, arguments also, which is okay. Which government do you think has truly contributed the most in these 75 years? And what do you think is still yet to be done? I think it's a huge agenda and I must admire uh, respectfully the Prime Minister because he is telling us that we have to think about 2047 now. So, while it is the Amrut Mahotsa, but we have to talk about the century as well. So, that there is a vision. And therefore, the uh, singularly important factor about the government and the leadership of Prime Minister Modi is that he has, in a way, educated the country or rather uh, made us to think big. See, thinking big is very important. Thinking out of the box is very important. And this nation had seen several brilliant big ideas out of the box innovative ideas taken to the level of fruition under the able leadership of Prime Minister Modi. This is something very important. Ideas come and go but then you never see them implemented with that resoluteness. Take the example of the Statue of Unity. Had, had we, did we ever imagine that, that this can happen? This. We are today talking about bullet train. Every other city has metro rail, railways these days. And then there is this Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana. I mean, people are getting shelter as a part of their right, not somebody's Meherbani. So, these are very significant things and therefore, Prime Minister has been really working uh, on the agenda of empowering the people. 
we are not here to distribute uh, freebies, subsidies, freebies. and stuff. Correct, socks. correct. We are because here to you're here take to people empower. along and empower. So, them. part of the process of education, security, empowerment, truly, is the entire package that we're Precisely. talking about. Precisely. But in the days to come, when India does enter the hundredth year of democracy and a vibrant democracy, what are those takeaways that you really think make us stand apart from any other democracy in the world? Well, I think something which we need to learn about is uh, the famously stated uh, statement of Prime Minister Modi that it is with Sapka Prayas. Everybody has to contribute. Sabka you cannot outsource. Sabka yeah. Vikas, Sabka like Saad, Sabka, 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 Sabka Vishwas or Sabka Prayas. Because everybody has to contribute. The nation is not just that of the Prime Minister or the, the Cabinet yeah, or the yeah, Parliament. Well it is your nation, it is my nation, it is everybody's nation and it is all of us who are responsible for the state of the nation. Thank you Vinayji, that was a very interesting conversation. So that was Vinay Sahastra Buddheji, a noted researcher, trainer, social worker, author and of course parliamentarian. His takeaway, Sabka Saath, Sabka Vikas, Sabka Vishwas, Lekin Sabka Prayas, currently heading India's premier cultural body, the Indian Council for Cultural Relations. Next week, we will have one more member of parliament on the journey. Until then, keep watching. Namaste. This is me, Shaina NC, signing off.